Hi guys. So to end the day, uh, this day when we've been talking a lot about documentaries and particularly an earlier panel today about the creative documentary, social issue documentary, uh, you know, the question I think most of you know, how does all of this come together? It's great to be a creative director, um, but, and some directors serve as their own producers, but most elaborate or complex films involve a lot of moving parts, and there's always a producer or an executive producer. But exactly what does a creative producer do? How do all the elements come together? How do complicated productions achieve success? How do multiple personalities come together to create these award-winning films? Um, Today, we have uh, two producers at the top of their game um, from Motto Pictures, Julie Goldman, um, whose recent uh, documentaries include The Great Invisible, Art and Craft, 1971, God Loves Uganda, Gideon's Army, Buck, Manhunt are just a few of them. She's an Emmy Award winning producer, many of you know her. And with her, uh, talking about their own collaboration and other, other collaborations is is Nancy Abraham, Senior Vice President of Programming at HBO Documentary Films. Nancy herself, multiple award-winning uh, productions via HBO. Um, so I'm just gonna bring them out. And we wanna leave lots of time for questions from you guys. So, Nancy and Julie. Um, hi, everybody. Hello. Um, we're excited to be here because we never get to talk about this stuff. We work together a lot, and we never really just get a chance to yeah. talk, Bullshit. reminisce, <laughs> figure it all out. Um, so, well, one of the things we were thinking was just to get a sense from the audience of how many people here are producers, documentary producers specifically. If you can just raise your hand. Raise your hands high, producers. Okay. That's a lot, that's a lot. And then how many people would you say you're like a first or second time producer as opposed to a seasoned producer? Okay, a good amount. And directors? More. And then the tough question, who are director producers? <laughs> There's saying. a lot of overlap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've worked on a lot of we actually have worked, we, Julie looked up it up on IMDB, because I don't really keep track, and so we have a list, but we, we've worked together now, this is, we're working on our 16th film together. So that's a lot. <laughs> um, I've been very spoiled. Me too, me too. Um, and so, and I've been at HBO like 20 years now. Um, so I've probably done I was trying to think how many films I've worked on overall uh, over all those years. It might be, it might be close to a hundred. It must be close to a hundred. Yeah, um, but you've been producing like close to fifty films. So or executive producing. Yeah, yeah or executive anyway. producing. So I don't know. Do you want to, for reference, do you want in case you want to ask questions about these films, do you want to know the list? Is that helpful? Okay. Let's see how many you know? This is in chronological order, more or less. Um, fashion Victim, The Killing of Gianni Versace. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta laugh. <laughs> Ryan loves that film. <laughs> it's a good film. <laughs> uh, Devil's Playground, Family Bonds, which was a series, actually. Uh, what Remains, about Sally, Sally Mann. Mann. A film called Black Sun, Cat Dancers, Sweethearts of the Prison Rodeo. Amy Dotson, producer. Yes. Uh, Sergio. The Nine Lives of Marion Barry, Quran by Heart, One Nation Under Dog, <laughs> uh, Manhunt, The Search for Bin Laden, uh, Gideon's Army, Three and a Half Minutes, Ten Bullets, and uh, this new film that just premiered at Toronto, The Music of Strangers, Yo-Yo Ma, and the Silk Road Ensemble, and then an un yet, and yet unnamed 16th film that we're currently working yes. on. Um, so I can maybe just interview you slightly about, um, since you're the ones with more of the hands-on experience. I mean, we were chatting earlier about the role of the producer and then more specifically the role of the, what you might call creative producer and how, 
uh, I think sometimes it's a bit of an unsung role um, when in fact there's a lot that, rely, that that is dependent on that kind of person, that kind of role. Um, so I don't know, maybe you could just talk about, like you've definitely worked on a, in, in a range of capacities from, from hands-on producer in the field to more of an executive, different kinds of executive producing. So yeah, I mean, I sense. think creative producing and creative executive producing um, kind of are in a, a similar place, but you know, the intensive, I guess the, you know, the uh, intensive hands-on version is a creative producer who should really be and is usually really across kind of everything in the ideal world, certainly for us in the ideal world, we start out at the idea and we come up with the strategy for how we're going to kind of get make that happen and make it happen and then what we're going to do to raise money to then enable that strategy. So um, it's really everything soup to nuts. It's how you're going to write grants, how you're going to get people to talk to you about the story that you want to tell. Um, it's access. It's every single aspect that you can imagine of the production that we are really involved in. So it's the creative side of the storytelling and kind of rolling with the punches during the, the making of the film, which always shifts and changes and you have to really be agile when you're producing films and be willing to you know, get extremely depressed and then kind of move on. Um, and then uh, it's everything through um, post-production which actually I really love post-production. That's my favorite time because I know we've got it and we're gonna like refine it and make it wonderful. So um, yeah, I do. I love I love color corrects because it makes it so pretty. <laughs> I like and the mix. I don't like mixes because I can't talk on the phone while I'm there, which <laughs> like sucks. So, but that's that whole kind of process through to really strategizing. Like, how are you going to get this film into the world? Who are your partners on the film? Are you you know that's the other thing. Like you're working. We're really like the liaison in the best of all worlds so that the director can focus on the creative. And that's why having so many directors who have to produce their films is a little complicated because that ability to really like hone in on what a director should do in the ideal world gets lost. Um, but yeah, I mean, and then distribution and now outreach and engagement and, um, and then you kind of think it's done but it always comes back, you know, it's like, you know, Place the Table premiered four years ago and we just got a call, oh, you know, there might be interest in doing something, can you do a cut down? It's like, oh my God, really? But right. you know, you do. So right. it is it is that kind of scope and scale. Um, and so yeah. much of letting the director, or enabling the director to focus on the creative aspect and realize a certain vision is dependent on all of those things being handled by a competent producer. And I mean, even definitely the access is a huge issue that can also often be an ongoing challenge. Like it's not, in my experience, it's like you need yeah. the initial access, but then sometimes something happens and midway through there's a problem and... Um, What's the biggest disaster that you've had <laughs> well, with access? Um, I don't know about with access specifically, but we've definitely had um, films where, because a lot of the films we do are verite, kind of observational, present tense films and you don't know what's gonna happen and you're kind of banking on certain things happening to, to get what you need to make a, a good film, there have been times when it hasn't panned out through no one's fault on the creative, on the team, on the filmmaking team, but just through circumstance, it really hasn't panned out to the point where it would make a really, really good film. And we've all felt like it's better to not make a film or you know, not make a mediocre version of the film we all envisioned. And so we've, we've definitely had things we've sort of shelved or written off and, and, um, and that's okay. I mean, uh, you don't want to do like it too heart, often. Heartbreaking at the time. <laughs> yeah, it can be. It can be. But when, but it's, but it's better than just pursuing something where you know it's never going to be to the level that you expect it to be. Yeah. I think. I think that's worse. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so in addition to all these skills, which which are numerous, and and, and you know, I guess therapy, being a good therapist, is part of that, really. Too. Well, that's what I was going to get to. The sort of um, the other, the attributes, I think, of what makes a good documentary producer, creative producer, um, and certainly flexibility being a huge part of that, because I've definitely been on a lot of films where they did end up in a good place, but they took a lot of 
extreme turns and went backwards for a while and then forwards and, and, and or changed compl you know, almost completely in terms of what the story was gonna be. Yeah, I mean, we had a film, I hadn't thought about this in a while, but when you just said that, um, where the, <laughs> the main subject left to do a reality show in the middle of filming. <laughs> the surreal life, even like a bad reality show for husbands. So yeah, it can be, not that we did with you. Yeah, yeah, no, we had that with Heidi Fleiss, actually. Should we suddenly turned up on Celebrity Rehab or something in the midst of a film we were doing. Um, so, yeah, so that flexibility, I think, is key. And then related to that, but a little bit different, I think this idea of openness, openness to collaboration. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's so important. That's the thing. It's like, <clears throat> you know, to me, the biggest thing, is, and, and the, you know, the people that you want to work with again and again are the ones who really collaborate, who really listen when you're talking, and not only when you're talking, but when you're getting feedback from the partners who are involved in the film. Um, and even if it's hard to hear, can like take a breath and then say, okay, you know, we're gonna, you know, pursue and, and, and really try to figure this out. Not lose your own vision, but wanna work with other people in general and not, you know, it's not, this is, this is such a team effort making these documentaries, even if it's a little team. I mean, often we have small teams, mm -hmm. but that team is so crucial. Everybody on that team is so critical in yeah. what they do, to, what they, to what they bring you know, what they bring to it is gonna make all the difference. So it's just, if you can't be collaborative, then it's not gonna be easy to keep going in this Yeah, business. and it often it limits the, the full potential of the film, I think. Um, and it's hard, I think you have to be, as a director, you could say you have to be extremely self-confident in order to be open to all this kind of Absolutely. input and, and collaboration. Um, yeah. And because if, if you're just defensive, then you're not hearing what could be potentially, um, you know, really additive kind of set material. I mean, we're often in that position uh, as the, maybe the commissioner, but in any case, the broadcaster um, coming in and, and giving, you know, we're reacting to material. Often we're helping to develop it from the beginning, but, but then at some point we're seeing what's been shot and what's been edited and reacting to it and giving our reactions. So it's sort of our job to, um, to be honest and to, to try and, you know, be collaborative and helpful and making it even better. And, um, and so often, especially if it's someone who maybe isn't used to working with HBO or is nervous about that, there can be trepidation and fear and, 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 and that is understandable. Um, but I think a lot of times having a producer, a creative producer who can kind of bridge those two worlds yeah. is really helpful because it, it just helps it, there be an atmosphere of um, give and take as opposed to or even understanding what's being said. And sometimes I'm thinking of like right. a meeting that we had one time where it was like everybody understood something different. You know, it was like <laughs> HBO understood one thing, the director understood something else, the editor understood something else. And I was like, we're screwed if we don't all figure out what this is gonna be. And, and we Get did, same page, but it was right. like, it was a really bad moment because right. the, you know, the director saying, no, 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 that's not what was being said. And I'm like, oh yes it was. <laughs> you know, it's that kind of thing where it's, it's really, you know, you have to, if you don't, if you can't figure that out in that moment, then you know if you don't have somebody there who's been on treading that same water before, yeah. it can be problematic. Right, both hearing not just what you want to hear, but really hearing what's being said, but then also being able to say what you want to say in a yeah. way that gets through. Thing, well, like we've had a situation where a director and producer had like a huge split in the middle of the production. Yes, and things that's like that. That's unfortunate. Yeah, That's which can good. be really tough That's when like ideal. I was EPing, but yeah, so that it's... And then the job of the other producers or the people around the production is really to help just try and keep it together. And how are you gonna deal with it? And who's gonna be in the edit room at which time? Because you're gonna be sharing, you're not gonna be sharing space. They're not gonna be sharing space anymore. So it can, it can devolve in interesting ways. <laughs> <laughs> and call on negotiation skills and other things like but that. But in that other situation, it was like basically it had to kind of cool down the process, the, not the, the split, but the, mm. with the kind of misunderstanding. And then a realization, yeah, this is what, this is what they meant, but, but now we can go back and have a conversation about what, what we think. Now that you understand what that discussion was, we can come back and have um, you know, our input in there, and that's what we did. Right, I mean, a it's, response, it's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so what else? What, what, what does a producer do that, I mean, we were talking about um, sometimes when people don't have an experienced creative producer, 
there can be, you can move forward with something and then there are problems that exist that then become bigger problems that could have been addressed at the time. Even stuff like personal safety. Yes. I mean, yeah. Yeah, you, I mean, so we have, well, like, with the films that we've done with Greg Barker, there's been travel in really, you know, tough places that, um, you know, it, where if he's gone to Afghanistan or, or Pakistan or, you know, places that sometimes are, you know, you have dangerous. to really, they're dangerous and you have to really get ahead of what you're gonna do with the travel. I remember when we were doing Manhunt, the week after Greg left, Peter Bergen, who is a writer of the book that it was based on, was on the same road that they had been on and they're, you know, a, they had like a massive accident with the car because the roads aren't good and he was in the hospital and it's just, you know, it's like you know that this is you know, something that you have to be really careful about and stay in touch with them and make sure that there's kidnapping and ransom insurance in place um, and make sure that you're well insured in general because that's something, I mean, when, when um, I did God Loves Uganda, I was telling you, it's like Roger, who was just here, a few minutes ago, um, Roger Russ Williams was directing it and we got involved after he had been in Uganda shooting. The first time he had gone, he had no insurance, he had no security, he had been outed, he um, was ambushed by this group of really horrible homophobic pastors. You know, all of these things had happened and so when we got involved, that was our job, was the first thing, was like, if you're gonna have to go back and shoot, which you are, what are we gonna do to put precautions in? How are we gonna, you know, so okay, we know that this other producer had made a film in Uganda and had a really good fixer and we call that fixer and you find out who's the best security from that person. You know, it's a, you start to put it all in motion in a way that's going to really, the first things first, like they're gonna get in there and they're gonna get out of there. And we just had a production that went to Juarez and there, you know, there's security issues in Juarez. So it was like, we got fixers and we had people that we hired security who were apparently useless, but you know, we did hire them. And um, you know, and there was no issue and nothing came up and that's, that's what you want. You want to never have to use these, these you know, kind of safety measures that you put in place, but you really want to have them in place. And you have to anticipate. I mean, that's where the experience comes in <clears throat> and a certain kind of OCD personality yeah. where you just <laughs> try and anticipate every single thing that could possibly go wrong and cover for it. Yeah. Um, and then, and what about, I mean, sometimes you work with other, so another skill yeah. I would say is like you also have to be able to juggle a lot of, within one production, yeah. you have to be able to juggle a lot of priorities and then ideally, you know, someone who's the director is more focused just on the creative vision. Um, but the producer has to juggle a lot of different things at one time. And then um, often you, as I do, work on a number of projects at the yeah. same time too. So how do you manage that? Yeah, I mean, that's, we have to. I mean, we have a company called Motto Pictures, um, which is a group of five of us. Um, it's Chris Clements, my partner, Carolyn Hepburn, amazing producer, um, Marissa Erickson, who's back there. I don't know if Sean's here, Sean Lyness. And, um, you know, this kind of, really we have to have enough to go going on so that we can all continue working on these projects and keep moving. We are often the last ones to get paid as the producer because we're usually responsible for raising the money. So um, that's why director producers can come in handy <laughs> sometimes because they also can defer. But often when you have it, you know, you'd, you'd never get the editor to defer and you have to pay the directors, something to live on usually because this is most likely the only film that they're actively making. Whereas for us, if we can be across a few films at the same time, we can kind of stagger knowing, okay, well, we'll you know, get the money for that next year and so this year we can do this project and we can, so we can juggle you know, five, six, seven projects at the same time and having a group of people makes that possible and having you know, uh, OCD also makes that possible. And, and then you're also, res so you're responsible for all the budgeting and accounting and all that kind of stuff and the payments to people and then also obviously all the yeah. clearances and then a lot, and then really the, yeah. all the legal stuff too. Yeah. So it's you know, a lot. I, I have a lawyer now who I really <laughs> love named Jonathan Gray. Um, there was a period of time where I, when we started Mono, when Motto started we did not have a lawyer and I did all the contracts and I really hated that. Um, but I mean, I knew how to do it because I had been working kind of in dealing with like business matters for documentaries for so many years. It's the same kind of thing of like, do, I, do we want to sell, can we sell our own films? Yeah, we can. Will we get the best deal? Probably not. But you know, 
do we want to? That's another job. You know, contracts and lawyering, that's another job. Accounting and bookkeeping, that's another job. If we can start to have other people who know who do that because they like to and they do it for a living actually take those roles, that frees us up a lot more. And that's the kind of thing that it's been really hard for me because I'm a total control freak, I think, in a lot of ways, which I, I, I hate to say because it's such an obnoxious quality. But, um, you know, this, I'm... That's my, that's my thing, that I'm letting go of a lot of these things. And, and clearances, you know, like we just hired a clearance person who's very nice, but, um, you know, we're still going, to move it along, you know, it's like, well, I know this person who knows this actor who we have to get his voice cleared, so, yeah. you know, it's you're endless. still going after it, you're still doing it. It's endless with the clearances, I feel like. Um, what else did I, well, I mean, another, another thing I think is useful to have a director and a producer that are both creatively engaged because, and for their purposes as well, you know, sometimes you need someone to play the bad cop or the good cop or, you know, you, you need to be able, it's good, and it's good f for them to have each other to bounce ideas off of and to get yeah, reactions. Yeah, we're usually, I'm the bad cop usually. I mean, that's <laughs> the truth. It's like, you know, the that director wants to like yeah. come out looking nice and, you know, and they also, you know, the director's going to be the front person for the film in a lot of ways. So it's important, you know, if you have to be the, the, yeah. the bad person in the, in the equation, it's better if it's me. You're a great bad person. But, you know, I mean, the other thing is, like, why do we do this? I mean, we do this because we love the stories that we're telling. We love to know. I mean, if you you can mention anything to Nancy, and she'll be like, oh, yeah, we did a film on that. You know, it's like literally <laughs> anything, like, come but up with three things. not in a cynical things. way. No, 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 not in a cynical no. way at all. Then she'll tell you things about it. I mean, it's like, so you, and you have a great memory. You remember dialogue from all your films. You can do voices. Some of them. <laughs> <laughs> After a couple drinks, I can do a few <laughs> impersonations of. Um, and it's like I mean, no, even yeah, after all these films, you love it, right? Absolutely, and and the next one is just as exciting as the one you just did, and even yeah. more so. And um, I think it is so much work, and you really to do it well, you really have to like bleed over these films and give it everything that you can, and you can't do that unless you're really interested and committed. Well, for a little diversion, <laughs> we <laughs> these are films that we worked on together, and they're yeah. the. They're, short, the HBO trailers. they're short HBO trailers, so we like them. They're like 55 seconds. Um, and so it's, um, I think, Sergio, Koran by Heart, and Manhunt. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Sergio Vieira de Mello. We all have an interest in Iraq stabilized. Let's send this guy who's a cross between James Bond and Bobby Kennedy. He was one of the bright stars, maybe the brightest. He was optimistic. He and his team could turn the tables around. The ceiling collapsed, the floor collapsed. We were thrust down. Please, I, I need your help. My Sergio is in the rubble. And he was directly in front of me, and it dawned on me, this is Sergio DeMello. I said, I promise I'm gonna get you out of here alive. We were communicating. Sergio, Sergio. We were driven. These guys were not gonna die in this hole. I put my mouth very close to the hole, and I say, I'm going to get him out. She has to be educated, but uh, she will be a housewife. In 97, Osama bin Laden had declared war on the United States, and no one paid any attention. There were just warning after warning. We knew something huge was going to happen. 
I think women make fantastic analysts. We have patience, perseverance, people who had really deep expertise in Al-Qaeda, they were women. We were trying to keep track of all the threads of various threats, and the language being used by these guys was like, oh my god, what are they going to do? This is it. This is Bin Laden. This is on our shoulders. You definitely need to know your moral center. My job is to kill Al-Qaeda. Either get with us or get out of our way. We're going to build from that courier network. We gained a lot of information out of him, including the name of the courier. Intelligence operations combined with special operations to create a deadly synergy. When you do this, eventually you lose one. How can you have a war on terror when terrorism is a tactic? You have a war against people. So who are the people that we're fighting the war against? So those are, those are three films that we've done now with this group of Greg Barker as director and and producer, essentially, yeah. but but also you and John Batsik yes. as this trio. And that's kind of unusual for us. We don't usually have three producers on a film. Yeah. But Our it's above sort of the line makes them very unhappy every time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is a lot. So but it's but it's really worked out great from our perspective. And I don't know, maybe you can speak to how, yeah. how you manage that with three different people. Well, it's good because I had worked with John for years now um we did a film about the new york cosmos soccer team that was our first film and um oh, that was the first. once in a lifetime yeah that was the first film and then we've we've probably done a dozen films together but with greg we've done five films in the last seven years um which is kind of amazing actually when i think about it but um it's really interesting because john's in london we're in new york and greg is in la so phone calls conference are conference yeah. yeah. <laughs> better than australia though yeah um, and Greg gets, is always awake, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but it's really been interesting to try to kind of like the division of labor. The, the production is centered in LA, but we're working on something now where we would kind of move it to New York, which I'm excited about. Um, but yeah, and John is a terrific producer. He's really wonderful. I'm sure you guys all know his films. And um, it's just, you know, you get a language when you're working with somebody for a long time, and it's so shorthand now. I mean, we used to talk for like hours, and now it's like a minute, and we get as much done. It's amazing. Um, so yeah, so it's that collaboration with producers. It could be also like working with um, uh, Katie Chavigny and Marilyn Ness on 1971, where they were producers and we EP'd it. Um, or, you know, and it, there's ways to really collaborate so that you can kind of bring the best out of the film and really do the best for the director in a way that's um, just more hands on deck, people who can, you can kind of really, really work well with and find a way. Sometimes that, that's great. And then there are times where it's like, you know, we're producing it through Motto, we're the producers, and we don't have other, other people we collaborate with. Um, but I was thinking, it's like Koran by heart. What were you going to say? No, I was just thinking about that and how, like, in a way, you, you can't have too much of an ego, especially when you're when you are collaborating with these people, because it's not about that; it's about what's best for the film. And yeah, I mean, it's it's in general as a producer, ideally, you don't have like a giant ego because <laughs> the director is going to be the person who's going to be invited to the festivals and um, fed it at the festivals and, and the center of attention and doing press. And if that's something that you feel like resentful because, you know, I worked my ass up on this film and I was a creative partner on this film and this really sucks, then you're going to be miserable. So okay. don't do Although it. producers should get more credit, I think. I mean, that, and I yeah, think that is starting to change. A it bit. would be nice if it was, I mean, I'm not like for me, press isn't as it probably should be more of an issue, but it's not, but, um, but it's the festival stuff that, that really is, you know. I mean, like, I just went to Toronto with um, music, music of Strangers, and as an EP, didn't get a credential. So, you know, things like that. That kind yeah, of just are a bummer. So you that's can't see movies. Um, but I was thinking, like, Quran by Heart was one of those really, oh, yeah, had, like, was... a bad moment because it's a Quran recitation competition in Egypt, but when we started the film, and for a long time as we were prepping it, it was in Dubai. It was a completely different competition. We, were, we actually had people on a plane to Dubai, and the organizers, there was, somebody, there was a political switch there, and somebody like, who had given us permission was out, and we didn't have permission to film there, and they would not back down. And we, we were really, persuasive and Greg was like sitting in their office and trying to you know get them to agree and it was just not happening so we that was like this moment we're like okay the film's not going to happen I remember I was right. in 
on vacation and being on the phone with you and it was like, but truthfully, and I didn't say this, I probably never said this to you, but I was so freaked out because that money had been spent in my head. <laughs> right, because we were in production. We'd advanced yeah. money because they were I was like, so we're going to get a kill fee. It's over. You know, and, and that, the my fee was like what was keeping us afloat at that time. So that was like, I was extremely motivated to find a Quran recitation competition. <laughs> Um, and we did, and it was actually. And then I, do you think it like out to be I, better? Those kids are so great. I mean, Rifta, amazing girl from the Maldives. I mean, what a character! How lovely. But you guys turned it around. I mean, so there was this. It turns out the oldest one in the world happens in Cairo, and it was happening in like two weeks. Yeah. And and they had to either get in or it was not going to be for another year. And, and we it managed was, it. It was crazy. I mean, we we really brought we brought extra people in who were like terrific field producers, and we all went to Egypt. Actually. Right, and this was like six months before the revolution, as it turned yeah, out. It was really you could feel the tension. I mean, it was it wasn't even was it six months even? I think it was August, and then in yeah. January. Yeah, it was, and I was like, well, I guess it's always tense here, you know, like that kind of feeling, but and like not realizing what was coming. And Greg's like, something's happening, you know. So, um, but it was it was so fortuitous because we love those characters. So it's like yeah. that's the other thing to really remember is like when the kind of most painful challenges come up, sometimes that can make so much of a better film. It can just turn everything in, in a direction unexpected and wonderful. Yeah, I mean, we had, I was just thinking of another film that we didn't work on, but um, Life According to Sam, we were following the story of this young boy who has progeria and his parents are doctors and they decide to devote themselves, particularly his mother, to research to try and find a cure for this um, disease which has a life expectancy of 13 years and he was diagnosed when he was two and they sort of said we're going to try and find a cure even if we can and so it follows uh, their personal story and this this drug trial that was underway and we got access to film the drug trial this is um, Andrea Fine and Sean Fine um, and but we couldn't we couldn't do anything with the material until after the study had been published in a peer-reviewed journal because otherwise it would compromise the the scientific integrity of the study. And we were led to believe that that would happen within a year. And then, it, as it turned out, it dragged on for, I would say, a year and a half, maybe two years longer than that. So at first, we were all like, you know, panicked and thinking, what are we going to do? And, and, you know, the film will never get done. But it actually became a plot point in the story. You know, how there's a lot of politics behind publication of, of scientific studies, as it turns out, and there's a process you have to go through. And, and we were able to show that. It's not just like you do a study and you get it published. Um, and in the interim, you know, we were able to show a longer continuum of their lives and their story because we were just around for longer. So it, it was actually a boon in the end. It's like Susan Kaplan's film that we did years ago, Three of Hearts. It was like oh, yeah. these three people in a relationship. Um, and the, everything, the end, it was a happy ending, and they had, like, two kids together, and, you know, it was this, like, kind of wonderful story, and then as soon as it was almost, like, fine cut, they broke up, and she started filming again. I mean, I, that was crazy. She filmed for, like, eight years with this one, but, um, <laughs> and that is such a dramatic point in the film, and so much happens after mm -hmm. that that's actually much more interesting than, like, hey, it's so great, we can make it work. Right. Right. So, what other? What would you say was your biggest challenge? Is there any one single thing as a producer, like on a particular film? Yeah, like where you're just like. I mean, aside from Karam by Heart, that was pretty bad. <laughs> that but was that. pretty bad. Um, I mean, every film has has that moment where it's just like, oh shit, <laughs> this is not. <laughs> this is, you know, we. We don't have those releases, or um, you know, there's just these moments where you're like, this could be a real problem, or you know, actually somebody who changes their mind and doesn't want to participate in your film after you've edited it. Um, there, that's are, rare. I would it's say very rare, extremely rare. It happened once. Um, hopefully, never again. You know, but so those kind of things are like the those, you know, really the toughest yeah. the toughest moments. You know, but there. They always are going to happen. I mean, you have to be prepared. You're going to have, like, a horrible moment <laughs> during the making of your film. I mean, I would say, like, Buck is probably the only film that we just never had a horrible moment. It was really weird. And it was like, you just <laughs> you kept worried it wasn't going to be it. good, right? Yeah. yeah, I was like, oh, this is going to really suck. This is so easy. But um, it was, and it was just like, the, everybody got along. That's it was a small team. We were, like, really close. Um, we loved the, the subject of the film. 
Um, I mean, things that happened that were not as wonderful with that film all happened well after distribution. So mm. it's just, you know, there, it, I guess there is always <laughs> moment and it happened but much later but that and it did well it, it got into Sundance which like when you had if you had said to me this film about like this guy who talks to horses like would get into Sundance I would have at the beginning I would have been like no way and even when they called I was like really this, this film <laughs> um but I mean we loved it but you know, didn't think anybody else was going to really love it the same way and then it, it's probably their most successful film and did you know huge numbers at the box office mm -hmm. and all of that you know for a documentary. Um, well, and being yeah. on the on the broadcaster side, you know, that's also the role of the producer a lot of times to shield us to some degree from those disasters as long as you can handle it, but also to communicate them to us when we can help and not yeah. be afraid to like bring us into that process. Um, I mean, but there's a couple things with you guys. I mean, like you first of all give, I, I you know, you don't feel rushed. I don't feel rushed doing a film with you. It's like, you know, fully bake this, you know, do not just like come in halfway and think right. that it's done. And that, and that's really rare. You might not know how rare that is. Oh, that's gosh. really rare. It's um, useful. Yeah. To have time. Definitely. To have the time. <laughs> and also like the trust to know like exactly that. Like, you know, I don't want to like call Nancy with every annoyance or every fear or every moment where you think something's going wrong, but you're not sure. Cause then you know, she's not going to want to work with you again. But um, you do, when, when you know something is going wrong, to know that you can trust the person that's going to, who's going to be like, let's figure this out together, as opposed to, you know, right. you fucked up, figure it out. Right. Right. No, you want to be collaborative. And, cursing a lot. Um, <laughs> although I do, I remember one, and yeah, the worst, the worst case scenario would be like if you, if the person didn't tell you there was some disastrous thing going on, which as you Julie said. was pointing out, it happens in most films. Yeah, no, one time, and this was really early when I was working at HBO, you know, I started to get these calls. I mean, this goes back to the 90s. And uh, it was some, it was basically a disgruntled crew person who was, you know, insisting that he, I, he called me from pay phones and that his phones were bugged and then there were all sorts of crazy allegations and that he was being followed and there were drugs involved. I mean, it went on and on and on. And, but we had to kind of take it seriously, so we, we had the person come in, and it's it's kind of a long story. But in the end, that film still got made. Um, yeah, not that not that I'm looking to repeat that experience. But it was a little hairy. But also, I mean, you sometimes work with people who are kind of crazy, you know. I mean, that's <laughs> it's we're are they're artists, creative, and, you crazy, know, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, the, it's it can be really intense, and you you know, right? And people are very passionate. You don't want that involved. person calling Nancy all the time, you know, and and throwing that crazy over there because like that's what I'm the crazy receptacle. <laughs> <laughs> Although we're there to help. Yeah. Um, <laughs> should we do questions maybe? Yeah. Is that okay? So the question is, how often do we bring subjects in during post to work with them out of respect for, for their part in the process? We don't. <laughs> I, I think that's, you know, unless it's some a situation where, I mean, we'll show them, I actually prefer not to show people the film until they see it with an audience. In the, that's the ideal world to me, because they've given you that trust, and it, it depends. I mean, sometimes you have different situations where you have an agreement, where they have to fact check it, where there are certain things that, that you have to show it to somebody before. We're doing a film right now um, about a young man who's autistic, and, and his um, parents said they really want him to see it. So we had his father, and he came in and screened the film, um, the cut of the film. and Yeah, and we did that with yeah. Sam in this film about Progeria. Yeah. But it was very, I mean, it was finished. It was basically finished when we showed it to them. But it was before the first public screening, because they wanted to see it privately. I just remembered when we showed it to the Family Bonds, which was the series that we did, and oh we showed it to the, to the family. They came in, the adults. And that was like, there was a really raw sexual discussion that had gone on in the film and they were like no there's no way like my son its friends are gonna see this like we cannot and and it was like a killer because sheila loved that line um i don't even remember this oh yeah <laughs> it was still good even without it clearly um and like and we changed it i mean that's you know that was that was what you, you know we respected that uh, it's just What's interesting is even like with Manhunt, all of the CIA yeah. team that came to Sundance were like, we're seeing this film beforehand. 
we were going to show it to them. Greg's wife had a baby, and he was like leaving two seconds after she gave birth and flying. So um, they he got there late, and John and I were like determined. We convinced them to wait and watch it at the first screening, mm -hmm. and I, I can't believe we convinced them because these are not easy really people worried. to yeah. convince, like CIA <laughs> operatives, and you know. Um, and they were so happy that they had done that. Yeah. I mean, Cindy was like holding my hand and crying through the screening and, and like just, you know, it was, yeah. but Much they, better. you feel embraced, you know, unless it's some, a movie where you are like a villain, but even then it's like you see it differently because you're watching it with other people's eyes at the same time. It's a exactly. very different experience. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I'm curious, um, in that situation with the family bonds, you had releases, but you did it out of just the human element that they entrusted you. You didn't have to legally do it, but you... you we did not have to legally change anything. We had their release, we had their cooperation. But don't forget, you're going to want them to be happy. You're going to want them to do press. You're going to want them... And this was a series, so this was like... A, a, you know, kind of extended press. Right. You don't want them to feel like they you misled them, they put trust in you. If it's something that's going to humiliate somebody, you don't want to put it in, for, you know. But it, I will say that... They were happy to say it on camera, which is kind of remarkable, but, you know, yeah. they didn't think ahead. But that's, I would say that's unusual, right? Like, I, I, it's not the norm to, you know, get someone's reaction to themselves on film and then change it from there. I mean, normally we're just putting it out there and sometimes giving people the ability to see it first before seeing it publicly, but right. we're not we're not looking for their reaction to it. Did you I say mean, most of the time you they see it publicly first, your films? Uh, yeah, I would say most of the time. Whether it's a festival or or even on HBO, you know. Yeah. Wait, before we go to another question, I just want to say something like it's a joy to make these films. It's an honor to tell these stories. I mean, like, that's what we do. We tell these stories because they're important stories to get out there, and we're the, like, incredibly fortunate conduit for these voices to be heard. So become a creative producer. <laughs> it's a great, great job. It's um, never it's boring. A, it's really never boring. You go into a million different worlds. You learn about so much, and yeah. you meet incredible people that are just... And awe inspiring. And, you know, like we have made editors, you know, this kind of revered part of the filmmaking team, which is great. But if we could elevate producers a little bit more, creative producers who are really involved, it would be equally wonderful. Um, and maybe get more people to get involved because there's not that many who, mm. people who do this. And mm -hmm. there's programs now like the what uh, Impact Partners is doing for emerging producers. Right. There's um, Sheffield Documentary um, Festival did the Future Producer School, and there are two producers from there that I saw at IFP. You know, there's there's programs now that are coming out that there was a big conversation at the Sundance Creative Producing Summit this year about how, you know, to do, to do this in a way that's, like, thoughtful and, you know... Producers have to make a living. It's sustainable living for producers as well as for directors and mm -hmm. editors and, and crew members. And um, it's just something that is a, a really exciting moment because it feels like it's finally, you know, you feel like you kind of like... recognized. Been, yeah, yeah. Yelling about it for a while and <laughs> people are hearing it and it's then people are yelling back and it's exciting. So I just want to... Before, yeah, if, no, we, if good... we ran out of time, I just wanted to say that. So. I echo your sentiments. Uh, questions for Julie. Just wondering, uh, what's... How do you determine which projects to take on and what stage do you usually get involved? You know, we all watch material that comes in and talk about it as a group. Um, there's like a feeling that I've always had for many years that like, you know, when there's a certain, when there's a film, like there's certain ones that you just like feel almost like a, like a, like that feeling of like falling, like, like falling in love, feeling like that, that like feeling in your chest of like pounding and like this, I've got to do this, I've got to do this. And I felt that with God Loves Uganda, I have to say, when Roger and those guys pitched it, I was like, I must do this, you know? And I, it's, you don't always have that, but sometimes it's like obvious. Like there's a project right now that, that we're getting involved with that I was like, I love this, you know, that kind of feeling. More often it's something <laughs> we actually think about and talk about and debate and, and it has to be a combination of things and, and I, really try not to do um, films for money. 
you know, just for money. Like, oh, it's funded, so let's do it. You know, it still has to be something we'd be proud to be working on. And, and usually, you know, you're working on these films for years. Right. So it's an opportunity cost. I mean, you're only going to make so many films in yeah. your life. You've got to pick the ones. I've, although we are it. trying to do more that are fully funded <laughs> because you can't keep, like, you know, raising from dollar one to the end. But, and the stage really depends. It used to be that we would come on later, um, but we try, to, we try now to come on as close to the beginning of the process as possible. And what do you... You come on all the way, all different times, right? Yeah, we, I mean, we commission some stuff from, from scratch, you know, we'll have an idea and want somebody to explore that idea and develop it and then go on to do a full production. And then we also um, acquire some films that are completely finished by the time we see them. And, and then everything in between, too, works in progress and rough cuts. And it's funny, because I remember Nancy years ago saying, yeah, you know, we work a lot of times with the same director or the same team, you know, and... And then, and you're like, but it's like now, you know, when you, and then you take on new projects too, and then you work with them. And like at some point, that's like such a huge mountain of people. Of that, alumni, yeah. sort of. Yeah, no, it's true. It's, 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 it's great. And, you know, you look back and some you work with again and some you don't for whatever reason. But um, when you see these clips going by, you're sort of like reliving all these crazy moments of your life. <laughs> Average time of production and how many people are involved usually. Both of those really vary. I mean, I think probably the shortest film we've done is like a year-ish production time, which is really short, and the longest was eight years. Um, wow, which usually, one was eight years? Oh, Susan Kaplan. right. <laughs> Three of hearts. Yeah. Um, I mean, that wasn't motto, but uh, it's usually, I would say, like two to three years is the typical time that we're working on the film. Mm -hmm. And the crew also depends, I mean... Um, it depends on the budget, and it depends on what we need for the project, but it's um, it's usually pretty small crew. I mean, the crew in the field is usually quite small, and then there's like the team of AP or coordinator, or, you know, like line producer, whatever you can afford out of like, you know, what you really would love to have involved, but it's, it's definitely but under 10 you, people usually. Right, I was gonna say, even if you could afford it, you probably wanna keep a core group of yeah. not more than 10, probably, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Okay. Thank you.